So we're on. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, of those of you who are on television, you can probably see that I am not Richard Hall today because Richard has been held up by the massive roadworks we have at um, uh, just coming into Masterton. Now, I'm just going to turn my cell phone off because there's nothing more embarrassing than having a cell phone ring in the middle of a gig. But um, anyway, so Richard and Kay are apparently on their way, but they haven't been able to make it because they're stuck in traffic. And I think just about every Masterson person knows what that's all about. Um, anyway, so my name's Keith Austin, and uh, I haven't got any of Richard's audio visuals with me, so you're going to have to put up with looking at me. However, what I'm going to do is take you through a little bit of astronomy 101, as it were. Um, a lot of people have asked me, um, how do you know what it is that you're looking at, at when you, you look up in the sky and oh, I can see Sirius and I can see Canopus, uh, the stars, or I can see um, Arcturus, or I can see, uh, at the moment, you can see Venus, the uh, beautiful, uh, brilliant white planet Venus uh, setting just behind the sun. Um, a lot of this, of course, is just familiarity, but there is a certain amount of what they call positional astronomy. Um, positional astronomy is simply the position of the planets and the stars and everything else in the night sky. Um, we can start, of course, with the, day, uh, with the daytime sky, uh, which involves the sun, and I think most people know what that is. Uh, it's a big, blinding, uh, white ball of light. Occasionally you get to see it. Uh, I haven't seen it myself for a while, but it rises from uh, here in the southern hemisphere. It rises from the east, uh, goes round to the north, and sets in the west. Um, fairly obvious. But in, um, in the night sky, we have uh, all the objects such as the, um, the moon, the planets, and the stars. And there's a certain rhythm to the way that these... Uh, astronomical bodies move. The moon is probably the fastest and it's the most obvious, but um, it, just like the sun, sets, rises in the east, goes around to the north, we're in the southern hemisphere, and sets in the west. Um, the planets are probably the most fascinating because they tend to move night after night, they move against the background of the stars. So you've got all the fixed stars and night after night you see these wandering lights and occasionally they stop and they actually go backwards for a while and then they stop and then they go forwards again. That's how you can tell that you're looking at a planet. Um, the other way of course you can tell that you're looking at a planet is, is quite simple. They're always on the plane of the ecliptic which is the same imaginary arc in the sky that the sun and the moon travel from east to west. And the other way is simply that the planets do not twinkle. The stars twinkle, but the planets do not twinkle. So Richard, as you can probably see, has just made it here, and uh, with the lovely K as well. And uh, how did you get on, Richard? Yeah. Traffic was solid, mate. The traffic was traffic was solid. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, are you ready to go? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, you have the con. Did you sing my song? No. <laughs> Later. <laughs> Later. Okay. Hello, folks. It's Richard and Kay here, as I said, and of course we've got Keith as well. So, running a bit late, so we better get on with things. Okay. So, looking to the south, all right, so around about eight o'clock for those looking at this on TV, uh, Southern Cross is reaching its highest point in the sky. All right. And there's a, you can't really miss it. And it's followed around the sky by the, t the two pointer stars, as you can see there. And they're now, about 11 o'clock. Uh, pardon? They're sitting at about 11 o'clock at right. the moment. Now, of course, we've got Orion's not there. <laughs> Orion is our sign of summer, and he's disappearing over the western horizon now. And then, of course, rising in the east, we've got the scorpion, which is our sign of winter. 
So Ryan's going to be gone, and when we we see him, of course, it's going to be the warmer weather coming back. Yes. So, so <laughs> I always think of Scorpius as being the winter constellation. Yeah. In the in the, That's right, yeah. in the northern hemisphere, of course, he is a summer constellation. Yeah. Where, but Ryan's always, you know, when Ryan's around, it's the summer and that sort of thing. But he's disappearing now. Okay, but the big brilliant star, undoubtedly, if you looked in the sky, there's a big brilliant star you see out in the west each evening. And, uh, well, uh, that's no star at all. In fact, uh, that's... Uh, <laughs> what am I... <laughs> <laughs> I, I should I should have You're talking about the one on the left hand side. Yeah, the side big there. bright star on the left is no <laughs> it's a planet, it's a planet Venus. But looking due north we've got uh the um, sickle with the uh bright star Regulus there, which is the constellation of Leo. All right. So that's looking due north. However, going back to our big bright star, the evening star, uh is the planet Venus, all right? And of course, it appears it's either called the evening star or the morning star, because in the ancient world, people used to think it was two separate objects, all right? But it's the same planet. It's just that we only ever see, you know, in the dawn sky before the sun rises, or in the east, or in the west, uh, just before the sun sets. And, um, and the reason for that is because Venus is closer to the sun than the Earth is, all right? And for those of you watching this on TV, I've just brought up a um, picture of Venus. In fact, that's how it looks at the moment. It's a gibbous. It's almost full, uh, but slightly gibbous, all right? So that, that's the planet Venus there. And it's a, of all the planets, when you look at it in physical size, it's the one that resembles the Earth the most in physical sizes. It's 95% the diameter of the Earth, so about the same size as that. And it all, but it orbits around the sun and much closer. It's only sort of seventy-three percent the distance of the mm. uh, be between the Earth and the sun that the Earth has. Okay. And a Venusian year is about two thirds of a of an Earth year. That's right. Yeah. Now, see Venus, Venus, because you always see this brilliant object in the sky, and the other one, of course, is Mars, which is another planet that looks similar to the Earth. Have been f always stories and stories being sold about them and. Probably Mars has been more science fiction stories written about Mars, for example, than any other planet in the solar system. Now, you can't see Ma Mars in the sky at the moment. It's in the dawn sky, but it will be coming back to us. But the interesting thing as we go backwards in time is look at how the stories portrayed them in the early days. The Martians were always baddies. Horrible. Traders from Mars. That's the one, yeah. So they were all, always baddies. But the Venusians invariably were goodies, all right? <laughs> so we had this idea that were the goodies and the baddies, all right? And the, of course, uh, all the, the threat always came from Mars. However, in the pre, before we discovered nuclear energy and the nature of it, the theory on the evolution of the planets was a little bit different from what it is now. It was believed that the energy of the sun simply came from the release of gravitational energy, and it was gradually... So what will happen is the sun was actually slowly cooling over time and becoming fainter. And this meant, of course, that... Uh, and this is where the idea about Mars came from also, that Mars would have been of the planets which is... Mars is further away from the sun than the Earth is, Mars would have been the first planet which would have got the environment capable of supporting life. Mm. That would have been followed by the Earth and then Venus. So whenever we looked at the stories, Mars was ancient, all right? Yes. And while looking at Venus, well, they must, they must be... An, much younger than us and indeed you can't see the surface there's even some suggestion that if we could see through the clouds of venus dinosaurs. there could be dinosaurs there yes. that's right <laughs> yes. tropical right. forests okay well so we have these advanced aliens living on mars and of course the dinosaurs and weird and wonderful creatures developing on Mar on venus and the reason of course why we said this about venus is that it's actually one of the most disappointing objects to look at for a telescope because essentially you can't see anything. The surface of Venus is completely shrouded in cloud. There's never a gap. So we can't, you can't even see if there's water, continents down there, or dinosaurs. We can't see that sort Those of thing. clouds covering Venus, they're very, very thick and heavy. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Our, let's get back to what 
what was really happening, when nuclear, we discovered nuclear energy, we began to discover the nature of stars. And essentially the sun is a nuclear furnace and hydrogen is being converted into helium, much the same process that occurs in a hydrogen bomb. Yeah. Okay, but the other interesting thing is the sun isn't getting fainter. The sun is slowly getting brighter. So it's the reverse of what we used to think, okay? So that's this is what's going to happen over time. So if we're looking at the planets and how it, things evolved, well, Venus would have been the planet, first of all, which was capable of supporting life. And... Um, However, <laughs> where are we? There we are. Uh, Venus would have been the first pl pl planet which was supporting life, followed by the Earth and then Mars. So let's have a look at what we know about these worlds to this day. Okay, the real Mars. Well, the Mars is a tremendously arid world and uh, Remember, it's always been a cold world because even now the sun is slowly brightening, so it's always been a cold world. Yes. It may have had water, but its loss of water was actually due to the fact that it's, it's low mass and it's lost, yes. lost it into space. So um, if you put water on Mars now, the atmospheric pressure is so low that it would rapidly boil. Yeah. See, the boiling point of water... I've heard, I've heard it said that it's impossible to uh, to boil an egg on Mars because the uh, the water just... Yeah, appears. well, the, <laughs> see, the, bo the boiling point of water depends upon the atmospheric pressure. Yeah. And because it is so low on Mars, you know, water bo boils a few degrees above zero. Mm. The other horrifying thing, of course, is that your body is made mostly of water. Your blood boils. Yes, your blood would boil in your veins, yeah. Not a nice way to die. It's in the... <laughs> end of the movie Total Recall yeah. where they ended up on uh, unprotected in the atmosphere of Mars and yeah. yes it was it was an interesting yeah. interesting and that's of course the reason why astronauts have to wear special suits it's to pressurize them otherwise they were their blood would boil yeah for that reason now Venus on the other hand that was What's there? Exploring the shrouded planet. Well, the interesting thing is we sent a spacecraft to Venus and it plummeted down and it sent a, a probe down to the surface and as it was getting near the surface, it stopped working. Uh, so the Americans sent another one and exactly the same thing happened. Then they began to realise, hey, there's something wrong here. So they built an armour-plated one mm. and that reached the surface. And what it discovered is the surface of Venus rather than being some sort of early paradise, was the nearest thing to hell that you can imagine, okay? So beneath the clouds, there's certainly no waters and things like that, okay? The temperatures and pressures are enormous. The surface temperature was 470 degrees Celsius. Imagine that. That's hotter than, than the inside of your oven. That's right, yeah. Oh, it's hot enough to melt lead. It's hot enough to melt rock. <laughs> And the atmospheric pressure was 90 times that on the Earth. So if you landed on, on Venus without a spacesuit, you would be crushed to death by the atmospheric pressure. And what was left of you would simply be incinerated by the temperature. You're showing a volcano there that sort of looks a bit like ours, you know, peaky. Yeah. But in actual fact, a lot of the volcanoes look more like squashed Yes, yes. Only, only when they're active with about that, but yeah. quickly they were like a failed downwards. scorn that yeah. didn't rise. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> mm. that, so um, that spacecraft that the um, Soviets sent, the one that finally uh, got um, got to <laughs> Venus, um, the they had a camera on board, and they found that the only lens that would survive the heat was made of pure diamond. Is that right? That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so that. Um, they took photos of the um, of the landscape of Venus through this diamond, mm. uh, this lens made of diamond. Yep. So, of course, the question: is, What's happened to Venus? And why a planet which we thought would be more like the Earth is like hell? You know. Mm. Well, the answer is that the interesting thing was that when we analysed the atmosphere of Venus and that sort of thing and various other things, once upon a time, it appears Venus was like the Earth. There was water on, on the planet and so on. But what happened over billions of years, 
right, is the sun slowly brightened, the temperatures rose, the waters, the seas boiled away, and eventually all you left, and even the water was broken down to carbon dioxide and, and, and oxygen, oxygen mm. and the oxygen goes into combination with things on the surface. But carbon dioxide is also a greenhouse gas. Mm. And so what happened, it blanketed the planet and temperatures just rose and rose and rose. So once upon a time, maybe Venus was like the Earth, all right? So maybe once there mm. were dinosaurs on Venus. Possibly, mm, yeah. Probably yeah. not. Probably not <laughs> probably long not. enough. No. <laughs> oh, come on, be more. <laughs> Micro sort of stuff and that. Yeah. yeah. We, we, but there may still be. You don't know what. I mean, you talk about extremophiles on Earth that are inside yeah. nuclear furnaces and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So they probably still arm. Well, the thing is we don't know. Extremophiles there. We don't know how, when this all occurred and, and so on. Yeah, and what's actually if we dug down into the, into the surface of Mars, what we uh, sorry Venus, what we might discover there? You might discover something further down. Mm. Depends how hot the inside is. Now this this is all very important for us because you see, ultimately the fate that Venus experienced, the Earth will as well as the Sun brightens. So when we look at the Earth with its all its beauty and so on, water, living things and so on, we're seeing it in just a moment in time. And this is something we people often don't take into account when they look out into deep space to, to beyond the solar system, detecting the possibility of planets similar to the Earth. What is the chance that life's going to be on there? We immediately think, oh, if it's like Earth, right? You'll have it, people like us. Yeah, it'll be just like the Earth. But let's have a look at the history of the Earth and how the Earth has evolved, okay? The age of the Earth is, um, which is the same age as everything else in the solar system when the sun was formed, was, is 4,600 million years, all right? That's the age. The origin of, the li of life on Earth occurred 3.7 billion years ago, all right? That means primitive life has been pres present on Earth. Primitive life, I'm talking about things the size of bacteria, bacteria. being present on the Earth for about 80% oh, of the Earth's so current history. Yeah. The evolution of multicelled creatures, these are life forms which are big enough for you to see without a microscope, occurred 800 million years ago. That re represents only 18% of the Earth's history up to now. Yeah. Evolution of land-dwelling organisms. Up to that time, everything lived in water. But yes. what happened was that plants and then animals invaded the land. That occurred 350 million years ago. That is just 8% of the Earth's history. So in other words, if we had a planet out there and another, ran another star, and uh, it had a similar sort of evolution on the Earth, there's only an 8% chance that we're going to find, you know, multiple... Assuming that evolution yeah. um, on this planet travels uh, at the same rate that yeah. evolution uh, did on Earth, yeah. um, when Earth was creating all these, there were some. There would be some differences, but it, it wouldn't be that, in, that enormous to affect these figures that much. Yeah. Complex, warm-blooded creatures, mammals, birds, and dinosaurs. We've been pretty certain now that dinosaurs were also warm-blooded. Warm the, the most of the warm-blooded the mammals in that appeared about a hundred million years ago. That's two percent of the Earth's history. Yes. Right. So to see anything like, not even not talking about us, um, about mammals and you know mice and things like that, only a two percent chance. Right. Now, the Stone Age. <laughs> that's when we, when we begin. All right. When when we we're actually using tools which are. Is, sets us apart from other living creatures. We were making tools to change the environment. Well, I won't read it. It's 0.0007% <laughs> of the Earth's history. Now, put this in reverse. If somebody, somebody out there was trying to check out here, there's a, over a random point in time, there's not much chance of them actually detecting us, is there? Yeah. Okay, and the age of technology begins 150 years ago, right? That's the age of technology. And that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, <laughs> naught, point two percent. Yeah, very, very small. <laughs> Look what we have managed to do in that tiny, period of time. A sliver of Earth's history. Yeah. All the way from um, 
uh, primitive archaeobacteria uh, through to uh, multicellular organisms, uh, your big land animals, to mammals, to humans, and finally to get us to uh, a technological age yeah. where we can actually um, send radio waves out from, yeah. from Earth. Yeah. Um, it's taken a long time. Absolutely, yeah. Yes. And this is what people don't take into account, is what Kate was saying, you know, you see, oh, there's a planet around another star. It's like, they, oh, are, are there th intelligent creatures on there? Well, let's look at the percentages. Primitive life was present for 80% of the Earth's history. Multicelled creatures, uh, planets, only one in six, if they were other, had the same history of the Earth, yeah. would have multicelled life forms. Land dwelling life forms, one in 13 worlds. Complex warm blooded creatures, one in 36. <laughs> Stone Age technology, one in 1,325 worlds. Modern technology, one in 30 million. <laughs> of course, the scary thing is, once they get to modern technology, how many of them actually survive? Absolutely. Because uh, we're threatening life forms on our own Earth. I mean, if we're not very careful, there will be massive, we'll be gone, and a lot of the other life forms will be gone too. Does this happen on other worlds as well, when well, you get that kind I, of I thing? Remember, it's one, one of the leading physicists said, uh, it been Stephen Hawking, I think, he, he said there's only two possibilities. Either we are alone or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. Yes. And the reason for that is if we're alone, see, science is telling us that life is as a natural thing. It's not something unnatural. It's going to appear on planets where the conditions are right. And so, therefore, theoretically, there should be other intelligent civilizations out there. If they're not, this means something must happen to them so they disappear. Mm. And, of course, we're on the verge of doing that now, whereby destroying the environment of the planet or nuclear war or something like that could throw us back. And we'd never survive that. Uh, because you can't rebuild our society. No, because you'd, you'd, we've already used up all the basic things. Yeah, you haven't got the need. resources. Yeah, without modern technology, you can't create most of those. The other, the other terrifying thing is, of course, that we are not alone. And, of course, if, we can detect, if anything can detect us out there, they're going to be vastly superior to us technologically. Yeah. And if you've looked like what we've done elsewhere around the planet world, planet, our world, to other living things, if other creatures are vastly superior, see us under nothing more than an animal. Mm. And not only that, if I was looking down and you look at it and say, look, that particular two-legged thing down there, it's destroying the environment. If we wipe out, you know, s several billion of them, there'll still be a good breeding population, but we could save the planet. <laughs> Isn't that a good idea? Probably is, actually. It probably is, yeah. yeah. It's just that nobody <laughs> wants to be part of the and cold group. Un unlike science fiction movies where we manage to outwit them, I don't think that's going to happen. Okay? Uh, the, other, <laughs> the other possibility, too, of course, is the conquistador. Um, uh, syndrome yeah. where oh there's a planet there it's rich in resources it's only populated by primitive two-legged creatures oh they, they they don't matter let's <laughs> get in there and, and plunder their resources yeah that's right yeah so i mean yeah <laughs> either way hopefully they're not like us as i say and always in in science fiction movies we, when this happens we, we manage to defeat these aliens don't we oh but the americans do, do you? yeah but that that would <laughs> yes. it, Let's put it into scale. It would be like a Stone Age culture in Africa defeating the United States of America. It's not going to happen. Is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there you are. So this is what we have to bear in mind when we're looking at worlds beyond the solar system. Uh, yes, we're looking for Earth-like planets because they're ones. An Earth-like planet is a planet that's got similar mass to the Earth. So it's got a similar sort of atmosphere and can hold liquid water. But it's at the right distance from the star whereby life and water can exist. All right? That's what we're looking for. And we have actually found them, you know. Um, so alien civilizations there. When we said one in 30 million, that might sound a big number. But the reality is that 
the universe is so large, even though our own galaxy is still going to be thousands of civilizations out there. Yeah. But the difference is, if they're spread out evenly, the distance between them is something like five or ten thousand light years, you know? Yeah. And that means, of course, that it, uh, it takes five to ten thousand years for us to detect them and them to detect us. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Because if they're 10,000 years away and they've got a good telescope, of course, they'd be looking towards where the sun is. And I say looking towards it because you won't even see the sun from that distance. Well, they're not going to detect anything coming from the solar system because they would be seeing our solar system as it was 10,000 years ago. And no one was sending out radio signals then. Yes, uh, exactly. If we pick up radio signals from another civilization, this is the other one, and they're 10,000 years, they're going to be 10,000 years advanced of what we see them as now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's if they still exist, you know? So, yeah, time, that's what it's all about. Okay. So, but anyway, we are discovering lots of new worlds. And a little while ago, as I mentioned before, the idea of worlds around other stars, most astronomers thought there were every plant every star has planets there's a natural byproduct of the formation of a star but it was all theory we had no physical evidence that's all changed now and on the last count we've discovered more than five thousand planets mm. orbiting other stars and that's just the beginning and our technology is still limited so yeah again i can remember a time when i was um when i was in my teens when you know Planets around other stars were purely hypothetical. Mm, that's, that's, that's not too far away. Yeah, exactly. that's right. Yeah. We've made giant strides in mm. planet discovery. And we're going to do so in the future. And now they're discovering planets, of course. They were, well, I wanted to I'll move on to that to look at some of the interesting planets we have near the uh, Southern Cross, uh, Alpha Centauri. The brighter of the two pointer stars is the nearest star beyond the solar system, just over four light years away. Uh, it's, but it's a binary star system, consists of two stars orbiting around each other, but both of those stars are very similar to the sun. One's slightly brighter, the one's, other one's slightly smaller. But they are sufficiently far apart that both will have their own terrestrial planetary system mm. and we've actually discovered in the Alpha Centauri we've already discovered planets orbiting around them okay so there's going to be a great race now to find out exactly what those planets are like uh, I'm, and I'm talking about also planets close to these stars that they're in the habitable zone whereby life could exist there yes but nearby to Alpha Centauri is Proxima Centauri and it's a red dwarf star. It's so close to Alpha, a lot of astronomers think that it's part of the system. All right? You can't see it proxima. It's the nearest star of all. It's slightly closer than Alpha, but you can't see it without a telescope. But we've discovered a planet around there. And it's an Earth-like planet, about the same size as the Earth, and it's in the habitable zone. Mm. Right? Now here I'm just bringing up, for those who watch it, you can see there's a lovely photograph here. There's Proxima. Yes. <laughs> That's how difficult it is to actually detect, right? Like, but, like yeah. a red jewel amongst white diamonds. That's right, yeah. Yes. yeah. Anyway, we know this, this wonderful planet that is that's orbiting around it. I believe the planet is just slightly more massive than the Earth, only about 5%, so that's nothing. It's in the habitable zone. And then, of course, many astronomers say, well, life could exist on there. Well. Maybe, maybe not. For those of you watching this on TV, you can see a, 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 an artist's impression of standing on the surface of that planet with the, the dwarf star above the horizon. And in the distance, up in the sky, you also you can see Alpha, yes. the Alpha system there as well. But there's one problem with all of this. Proxima Centauri is a flare star. And it is subject to violent eruptions to the extent that it more than doubles in brightness. And that means that any, and because it's a faint star, any pl the planet, this Earth-like planet is pretty close to it, all right? Yeah. It's about a tenth of the distance the Earth is from that. So when this star explodes, that poor little planet will get blasted to the, 
most likely if it's in the way of the main blast, its atmosphere would be ripped off of it and so on. Yeah, so. So oh. most uh, red dwarfs are flare stars, is that mm. right, Richard? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, a large, well, even the, the small ones are, and this one is quite noticeable, yeah. yeah. You see, suddenly you go look for a telescope, it's double the brightness. So yeah. life, life would find find it hard to get a, a foothold. Absolutely, I don't think, because yeah. Because of the unpredictable. Thing. But anyway, nonetheless, yeah. what we do, the point is we are discovering Earth-like planets around there, and so what's out there in the universe, vast numbers, and I think it's time for me to shut up now. <laughs> So, say hello, everybody, and we'll, we'll, we'll catch up you with you in the near future. And remember, out at Stonehenge, if you want to come out and see these stars, get in touch with us, okay? Because we do put star evenings on, okay? Yes. yes. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody else.